Welcome to the Renaissance and welcome to Entering Behavior for Negroes Path 1. And to you, our dear viewer, it is never our intention to offend anyone with our videos. It is not also our intention to suggest, insinuate or preach hate towards any group, race, tribe or person. There is also no propaganda or any deliberate attempt to misinform anyone with our videos. The goal is for you to look for the books, journals, magazines or other publications referenced and study them yourself. Remember, there is no excuse for the young people not knowing who the heroes and heroines are or were. Nina Simon And from Katharji Woodson even schools for Negroes then are places where they must be convinced of their inferiority. And here is a big shout out and note of appreciation to our donors and to you that gave us a new microphone. Thank you very much. Entering behavior. Please remember our videos are not academic and that we are not authorities in any field. These materials are for demonstration and reference purposes only and we used the term for lack of a better term. That's why we are using entering behavior. Remember, we are not authorities in it. We are not authorities in child psychology. We are not authorities in education. So our interest is what we can use to propagate our message. That's ideally why we chose the term. Otherwise, we could have used something else. So, have you ever heard the term entering behavior? Or have you been in a mathematics class and the teacher says start from the known to the unknown? Please remember the most potent weapon of the slave master against the Negroes, formerly Grometers and formerly Guineans and formerly Ethiopians, is that the Negroes listens more than he thinks. This makes the Negro believe what he hears ahead of what he reads or knows or experiences. This is very important to note and our examples are things like Genesis 4 14 to 17 only three people on earth but Cain still found a wife and the Negro still believes the story. Adam, Eve, Cain, Abel, Seth. Cain murdered Abel so where did Cain get a wife from? But the Negro still believes the story to a 200% accuracy. So please, before you say it's not only the Negroes that believe the story, remember, before you do what others are doing, you have to know what they know and also have what they have. This is important because if the slave master is targeting the Negroes and they say because others believe it, we have to believe it. That means the slave master will get them, subjugate them, enslave them, while leaving the others who also believe the same thing. And another example is in Exodus 20:24, which describes an altar, but the Negro believes his altars are shrines, while the slave master's shrines are altars. You need to investigate this yourself. Look at that chapter and verse and compare it with what you see in the church, in the mosque and in the synagogue. Since they tell us that the Quran, the Bible and the Torah are all from the same being so you understand what we're talking about and Deuteronomy 34 1 to 8 proves that Moses couldn't have written the Torah and Joshua 24 29 to 31 also proves that Joshua couldn't have written his book but the Negro still believes they could have because the slave master said so remember the Indian narrative from the Indian wannabes is also based on say it often enough they will believe. Remember that as well. And a quick example of what entering behavior could mean in this instance is from Genesis chapter 3 verse 1 and it says, Now the serpent was more subtle than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. And he said unto the woman, Yea, had God said, Ye shall not eat of every tree of the garden. And therein shows you a typical example of entering behavior. The serpent started by asking the woman if God actually said she should eat all the fruits or not eat all. Whichever way you look at it, he started from the known to the unknown. 
and look at what the woman said and the woman said unto the serpent we may eat of the fruit of the trees of the garden but of the fruit of the tree which is in the midst of the garden god had said you shall not eat of it neither shall ye touch it lest you die so now you see that the devil had or the serpent because the bible never said it's the devil it said it's the serpent so the, the serpent obviously had what you will call very good understanding of entering behavior so imagine if the, that three was still there but god did not tell them about it so how did the serpent have presented the case that's something of another day but our interest is to show you how that entering behavior works now we show you another instance of it in a different scenario as well let us reference savage africa being the narrative of a tour in equatorial southwestern and northwestern africa with notes on the habits of the gorilla on the existence of unicorns and tailed men on the slave trade and it was by w winwood reed and it was published in 1864 and there we see the following my brethren you see white man bad too much ugly too much no good you won't sabi how man like that come to live in the world and that's another case of entry behavior you see he provided a background of who he wanted to talk about and then put up the question you won't sabi how a man like that came to live in the world that's another case of entering behavior there is a background to what he was saying it is the previous knowledge the people already knew about the people he's talking about so he provided that background and then asked them if they wanted to know how such a person or such a people came to live in the world and gave this background story as a narrative of how they became what they look like to him that's a case of entering behavior and now there is another one a very practical one which is what we're going to show you shortly so on your screen you will see what looks like a nigerian map showing something they called six geopolitical zones in nigeria our interest is in the red portion where it says southeast so in that southeast they have a lot of roads that are broken dilapidated because the place is being run down by the slave masters this is common to the entire nigeria and remember we told you the fulanese and the yorubas are the slave masters foot soldiers the yorubas provide the diplomatic angle while the fulanese are the military wing the houses are just foot soldiers they use them for wars and all that they are suffering as well but they are slaves they have no say even though they are the majority but the owners of the place are the fulanese the yorubas play the second fiddle but they provide the diplomatic angle to the slave masters you need to bear this in mind they are just from dahomey the slave master brought them rebranded or renamed them yoruba that's how they became yorubas if you check your historical records you won't see Yorubas until a certain period. So in the area called Southeast and including parts of the South South as well. So when they build new roads, not new roads, when they fix old roads, this is where they have been stealing resources from the days of coal, palm oil to crude oil today. That's where they steal from natural gas, everything. But when they build a road, they manage to build a small road. They will put a sign saying Sukkok. Sukkok is an Islamic bond. That's an entering behavior. They are trying to Islamize the place. They are propagating Islam. So we'll show you where they documented it long before today so you understand what we are talking about. Let us reference a history of the colonization of Africa by alien races by Sahari H. Johnston and it was published 1899 and there we see the following unfortunately any race of purely negro blood accepts and loses christianity with great facility the negro unless he be mohammedanized that's our interest the negro unless he be mohammedanized note this point very well that's why they are doing the sukkok in the southeast and south southern part of nigeria because the plan is to ultimately islamize them 
and if you doubt what we're saying if you know any so-called african-american you can check very well for those that can reason because you know most of them are just more interested in telling you they are now indians or not even related to africa you will notice that somehow they are also working to make them mohammedans as well that's muslims because they understand that that is a stronger yoke so you see where it says the negro unless he be mohammedanized is easily converted and as easily relapses into gross superstition or a negation of all religion including his former simple but sound ideas of right and wrong that christianity may become permanently rooted in a negro race it is necessary that it be maintained by a higher power for a long period as the religion of the state so you understand what we're talking about that's why they are using that entering behavior of sukkok signs in the southeast and south south which is predominantly a christian area so when they present that sign it's gonna give some people soft spot for islam they will think islam will give them something good open their hearts to it and of course that's the yoke believe it or not so if you look at the map on your screen it's from this same book you will see that in the area where yoruba is that's in the guinea area there is nothing yet like yoruba there you have dahomey you have gold coast which they renamed to ghana today you have togo that you have there you have all the other small countries so they carved out the yoruba foot soldiers from what you have as the homie now remember there are more yorubas outside nigeria than inside nigeria but because they are foot soldiers to the slave masters these are people without the most basic of humanity and common sense they have to be used by the slave masters that's what they do the yorubas provide the diplomatic angle while the fulanis provide the military angle that's how both of them work together the houses like we told you are just used for soldiers the slave master wrote this for them they have a guidebook which if you conduct basic research you will understand what we're saying so you see that there is nothing like yoruba in that area so that's why they keep pushing the yoruba down use them as a tool of conquest if you were to check any further or you research very well you will discover that they got that name yoruba from yoribe which we're going to show you shortly from the next book we have not conducted extensive research on it but just to give you a little idea and you can conduct that research yourself let us reference the missionary history of sierra leone by reverend henry sedal and it was published 1874 we see a map on that map you see where it says yoribe it is that Yori Bay that they changed to Yoruba now brought their foot soldiers from what was Dahomey and brought them into what you now call Nigeria. A portion of it though, because in all their places they want to enslave the Negro, the slave master needs a fool to act as an enemy within, in which case they needed the Yoruba on this side of the block. Likewise, they have the Fulani on the other side. Remember, Negroes are not all the people you see, but pockets of people that the slave master is interested in for whatever reason. That's not our interest. We want you to conduct further research on that Yori Bay. Look for it and you can post your comments in the comment section. Our interest is to get to the root of what they are doing. Now, remember, for the Fulani, we have already seen enough of them. You can see what they are doing today. You can see how the slave master and the Yoruba media is shielding them. We ask you today, have you seen or how many times have you seen a Yoruba church criticizing Fulani Hatsmen? It's because they all work together. So for clarification, let us quickly reference the making of Northern Nigeria by Captain C.W.J.O. and it was published 1911 and there we see the following. Under the new arrangement, the protectorate of northern Nigeria would have no coastline and all goods imported into it from overseas would necessarily pass first through either Lagos or southern Nigeria. Now from that statement alone, if you understand the basic English, you will know that Lagos is not part of southern Nigeria. So you see here it says Lagos or Southern Nigeria. Now we have numerous documentation that show that Lagos was originally part of the Gold Coast, which is today Ghana. At that time, before they now ceded it to Southern Nigeria, there was an amalgamation before the other amalgamation, 
but let's just go forward so you understand what we're talking about so it says the recommendation of the committee was therefore that the tariffs of lagos and southern nigeria should be assimilated and brought into force along the whole coast that goods on which duty had been paid in either protectorate should be free to pass into the other or into northern nigeria and that since it would be impossible to determine precisely what proportion of the customs revenue was derived from the duties on goods for consumption in northern nigeria the custom receipts should be allotted in such proportions as the secretary of state should from time to time direct our interest is for you to see that lagos was not originally part of southern nigeria so they carved out the yorubas from the dahomey side and they used them for the conquest so the reason is because they look like the negroes you won't understand what they are doing that's why you see they all work together very closely together with the fulanese but from the map of nigeria you saw earlier you see where they said southeast that's where they tried to make sure that the southeast does not have a coastline now remember the ports in all those areas in what you call the south south are also closed and you remember the game of the slave master is to put the negroes in a difficult position to make control possible that's why poverty is in africa the goal of the yorubas the Ashantis and the Fulanese is to make sure that re region remains poor. That way, it leaves it in the hands and control of the slave master. Even those that are yet to be born, they know where the fools live in that region. So, look at it from whichever way you like, conduct your research, come to the comment section and tell us that this is not true. We shall ultimately show you where they documented them as well. The reason is they are sure the Negroes don't read, and even when they read, a Negro believes what he is told more than his experience or what he is seeing. So even if a Negro is looking at this map and you tell him that this map is not green but yellow or brown or not even there, provided you are persuasive enough, the Negro believes you. If you doubt what we are saying, we can give you a little example. In any case, we leave the example for another day because we have gone far into this video already. But to our topic of today, let us remember that originally the Negroes were not considered human and the game of the slave master is to leverage on the Hamitic and Negroid groups who are not very sensible, they are not very intelligent. Now remember, it's only a fool that you will give a gun to go and kill somebody for you and he goes for nothing sometimes. So if you looked at how they did the slave trade, it's the same thing they are doing today. The reason you see the Fulanese and the Yorubas working tirelessly to see how they con conquer to the ocean before 20 whatever is because of the digital economy that they are anticipating. That's why you see them a bit in a hurry. Let us reference the Congo and Coasts of Africa by Richard Hardens Davis and it was published 1907 and there we see the following. At about this same time, an English captain threw overboard, chained together, 136 slaves. He claimed that, had he not done so, the ship's company would have also sickened and died, and the ship would have been lost, and that, therefore, the insurance companies should pay for the slaves. The jury agreed with him, and the solicitor general said, What is all this declamation? about human beings this is a case of chattels or goods it is really so it is the case of throwing over goods for the purpose the purpose of the insurance they are goods and property whether right or wrong we have nothing to do with it in 1807 england declared the slave trade illegal a year later the united states followed suit but although on the seas Half frigates chased the slavers on shore a path of our people continued to hold slaves until the civil war rescued both them and the slaves. So you see how the Negroes were classified at that time. Right or wrong, they were goods. We will ultimately show you what the courts are supposed to be doing, what they are designed for. They are never designed for justice and we shall prove that to you. These are all documented and we will show you what they are supposed to be doing. Anyways. But then, our interest is that you see that 
they were able to get the jury and tell the jury that those human beings thrown into the sea were just goods they were chattels but you see the indian wannabes come here today to come and mess around because we know they are working for the slave masters ultimately we will show you where the indians and the negroes rank they rank lowest in humanity so that's why you see the indian wannabes do not know where the slave master is going because at the same point they do not understand what the game is all about so they are only interested in oh they are indians they are indians that doesn't make sense perhaps the slave master has promised them one little thing let's show you what we mean by their claim not making sense and is of no use however going further down you see where it says as early as 1718 Renal and Didrot estimated that up to that time there had been exported from Africa to the North and South Americas 9 million slaves. Our own historian Bancroft calculated that in the 18th century the English alone imported to the Americas 3 million slaves while another 2.5 million purchased or kidnapped on the west coast were lost in the south or on the voyage thrown into the sea. For that number, Bancroft places the gross returns as not far from 400 millions of dollars because that's what the Negroes were calculated as at that time. They were not supposed to be humans, which is still what they do till today. That's why you see in the United States, for example, you will see a case of obvious murder. The police will shoot a black man, so to say, or so-called African-American and the jury will rule otherwise it's still the same thing they are doing the only difference is that the negroes do not know but the rest of the world know that's the thing and that's why you see all these things here you see those ones coming with being indian it's just out of pure stupidity it's not like they don't know they are lying that's why you see some of them they'll come here and say something and expect you to believe what they are saying without any proof you see all these books that they will say oh the slave master wrote it even when this is strictly or completely against the slave master's interest if you looked at it very well but they also understand that the negro believes what he hears what he is told ahead of what he reads that's why you see some so-called african-americans they will be looking for ways to tell you that oh these books are wrong these books couldn't have been right they were written by the slave masters but then when you ask them what is the benefit of be you being indian they can't say Meanwhile, when they were Grometers, when they were Guineans, when they were Ethiopians, the Indians were still Indians. They hadn't changed. It's only them that want to now change and become Indian, which is as unfortunate as it is ludicrous anyways. So further here, for the Indian wannabes, it says, In 1800, Weberforce stated in the House of Commons that at that time, British vessels were carrying each year to the Indies and the American colonies 38,000 slaves and when he spoke the traffic had been going on for 250 years remember the Indian wannabes are claiming that the slaves were taken from Americas to Europe and then from Europe to Africa and then from Africa to Americas you see it's very ludicrous but let's just laugh it off and move on so it says after the Treaty of Utrecht Queen Anne congratulated her peers on the terms of the treaty which gave to England the fortress of Gibraltar, the island of Minorca, and the monopoly in the slave trade for 30 years, or as it was called, the Asianto, in bracket contract. This was considered so good an investment that Philip V of Spain took up one quarter of the common stock, and good Queen Anne reserved another quarter, which later she divided among her ladies. Now, you see that it was something they did with a lot of pride. At that time but they're now trying to make it look like oh it didn't even happen and these Indian wannabes are helping them out whereas they could have stood their grounds to say whatever reparations you want to give us give it to us now and remember why all these things are coming up is because of the digital economy they are not sure which way it's gonna go so they need to get and deceive the Negroes out of their identity one more time before that period that's why they contracted these indians imagine an indian straight head indian coming to claim that they are the people sold and that the woolly hair doesn't matter you see how sensible or senseless they can be so but let's go further to see one or two little things 
Let us reference a new voyage to Guinea describing the customs, manners, soil, climate, etc. And it was uh, written by William Smith, Esquire, and it was published in 1744. And there we see the following. In this country of Guinea, the English have trafficked a great many years, but especially since the conclusion of the last French war. It has been so improved that whereas in the year 1712 there went only 33 ships from England to that coast, in 1726 it was proved before the commissioners of trade that there had been there the year before above 200 sail to the great increase of navigation and the advantage of our plantations in America. So our interest is the advantage of their plantations in America. The issue here is that the Indian wannabes think that the slave trade was where you just bring some people and, and label them slaves. They didn't know the technicalities and all the brutalities and the number of people murdered over it. If a Negro ran away or if he didn't work well or he got old enough that he couldn't work again, they killed him. And to kill him, they have to bring a valuer that look at the slave, place a value on him, and pay the owner, and then kill that slave. Then these people are just trying to trivialize the whole thing in their Indian wannabe project. But anyways, at least we continue to make them look stupid because they can't provide any single evidence of what they are saying. And unfortunately for them, when an idea gets into the brains of a Negro, to eradicate it can only be by cutting the head off. That's why you still see them keep shouting it. One came here to say, oh, that he had debunked the concept of the woolly hair. He didn't. He just said something that made no sense. That, uh, uh, what did he call it? Jesuits. We are calling them Negroes or something like that. That's all he had. He didn't even provide where they called him Negroes. He just said they described them as Negroes. Whereas there was no such thing, no proof, nothing. But because they think we should all be gullible, the same way they say because the Negro just listens and obeys as a born slave, they expect all of us to now listen to whatever they are saying, even if it's a lie, and just believe them, which is as unfortunate as it is ludicrous, we would say. So let us look at a few cases of mutiny. Now remember, for the Indian wannabes, we are looking forward to when they will show us documentation of how the Indians also mutinied between America and Europe and between Europe and Africa and of course between Africa and the, the new world as they were called so that their stupidity can become obvious by the day. So we see where this author tells us about some mutinies. He says, these three mutinies I have here related are all that ever happened where I was present. Though I have gone many voyages to the coast of Guinea, know this very well, but I have heard of several that have ended in a very tragical manner. However, to avoid being tedious, I shall relate only one which is very remarkable and happened on board the Ferrars galley of London, Captain Mesevi, who by his overcare and too great kindness to the Negroes on board his ship was destroyed by them, and the voyage at last came to nothing. I met this gentleman at Anambo which you can see on your map if you looked on the coast of Guinea in January 1722. At his coming on board my ship, he informed me of his good fortune in that he had purchased near 300 Negroes in a few days at a place called Setricru on the windward coast of the coast of Guinea, which happened in this manner. It seems the inhabitants of this place which lies near the seaside had been often misused by some inland people who for a long time had treated them in a villainous manner. Whenever they went to their towns with salt or any other commodities to sell, for knowing the people of Setri Crew did in a great measure depend on them for their food, which is rice. They took their commodities and gave them just what quantity of rice they pleased in exchange. The Cetre Cruz, having long complained of this injury without redress, resolved to bear it no longer, but to revenge themselves by arms, and they were crowned with success, destroying and taking all the inhabitants of the principal town where they used to go and buy rice. Captain Masevi 
happened to anchor near Cetri Crew just at that time and had the opportunity of purchasing a great many of the captives at the easy rate for the conquerors were glad to get something for them at that instant since if a ship had not been in the road they would have been obliged to have killed most of the main captives for their own security now the indian wannabes are telling us that this thing was happening it didn't happen in americas it didn't happen in europe it only came to happen in the coast of guinea so at which point did the slaves start reacting and start mutinying that's what we keep asking these people that refuse to use their brains to see where the slave master is going had it been what they were going for was something that would be beneficial to either the indians or the negroes one would say oh okay let's help them propagate it this is something they will benefit nothing for they will instead be favoring the slave master but they still want to run with it but going further you see that he said that they would have killed the men captives this alone proves to you that it is impossible for your chief to have done it remember at that time that they are saying this to put them down is very easy there hadn't been money in what was negro land at, at that time it was still trade by barter so there was no way the people would have just gone to just massacre their own neighbors just for no reason and they didn't have soldiers standing soldiers because there is no way you can pay soldiers when there is nobody you are protecting from yourself except the slave master that was coming to capture them and remember some of the negroes at that time didn't know what was happening there were no news channels there were no radios there were no tvs so all they would see was that this community had been raided and destroyed they called the slave raids or riders war but the christians and muslims that were doing it had a name for it slave raid and the muslims called it razia so these other people thought it was war so they would go and see nobody if you had seen some of our videos you will see what they said where the slave hunters come those that escape will commit suicide after all so now anyone telling you that oh it was one chief and it was a cell such a person is not only ignorant but is actually a liar because there is no way you can sell another person he has to be by force so you see here that they would have killed the men because they know that the men would have killed them so ask or tell us why the men will not react until there's an opportunity that's because they are fully armed if they say they were selling children you will say yeah children cannot overpower anybody but tell us how somebody can control 300 men at that time they gave the world the impression that the negroes were like cattle so the same way a man can rear 300 herds of cattle that's how they presented the negroes to the rest of the world they even claimed that they didn't have a language so all these people the indian wannabes the fulanese the barbers the tuaregs the arabs the europeans that did the slave hunts they are together in trying to hide that part of history that's why you see this indian narrative coming from nowhere so he goes further to say after the captain had told me this story he desired me to spare him some rice having heard i had purchased a great many thorns to to the windward where he had bought little not expecting to meet with so many slaves this request i could not comply with having provided no more than was necessary for myself and for another of my owner's ships which i quickly expected an understanding from him that he had never been on the coast of guinea before i took the liberty to observe to him note this point very well because the indian wants to tell us that the indians had so many languages too like the negroes but there's one place we're waiting for them let them exhaust all the things they are using to make their claim you will understand how stupid they will look when we expose that too so he goes further to say that as he had on board so many negroes of one town and language it required the utmost care and management to keep them from mutinying and that i was sorry he had so little rights for them for i had experienced that the windward slaves are always very fond of it it being their usual food in their own country and he might certainly expect dissatisfactions and uneasiness amongst them for want of a sufficient quantity this he took kindly and having asked my advice about other matters took his leave inviting me to come next day to see him 
so you can pause the video and read it yourself but our interest is where it says just further than at four o'clock the negroes were to supper and captain masevi desired me to excuse him for a quarter of an hour whilst he went forward to see the men negroes served with victuals i observed from the quarter deck that he himself put pepper and palm oil amongst the rice they were going to eat when he came back to me i could not forbear observing to him how imprudent it was in him to do so for though it was proper for a commander sometimes to go forward and observe how things were managed yet he ought to take a proper time and have a good many of his white people in arms when he went now these same people are telling us that the negroes were just quiet they sold them it the only mutiny when it's time to ship them you see what how this case is going remember they later murdered this man the negroes mutinies and killed this same man obviously you can see he didn't have experience he didn't hadn't been there before this was his uh, first voyage to that coast to capture slaves and he was lucky to get 300 now if you look at the number they are calling somebody will be telling you oh no these numbers are written by the slave masters because they want it to be true that only 350,000 were exported for 400 years of slavery or if not more so you see how senseless these people are they just want to make sure you believe a lie they know is a lie they benefit nothing from it but they still want to lie which is most unfortunate anyways in any case the bottom line is that they killed the man when they would need our interest is to show you how dangerous the slave trade was remember they were armed hundreds of soldiers that's why the armies you see in west africa today are the slavery in terror groups this is why you see that when you ask for freedom in places like nigeria in places like biafra in places like ambazonia it is treasonable it is terrorism because the slave master hides behind these unintelligent hermetic and negroid groups the yorubas the fulanese the babas the tuaregs and tells them what to say and what to do because they don't know what is going on that's the truth of it they don't even understand if you notice some yorubas come here and you see how they talk that should tell you exactly how mentally inferior they are but they will try to present it to you as if they are saying something sensible to everyone now think about it somebody's parents is murdered they are telling you that it is okay for murdering them for unity so you see that they don't even understand what the unity they are talking about means now you ask them okay can you show us when they the people that gave you the guns you use murder their own people they can't show you see that's why if you notice even the so-called african americans they will tell you that oh no that they want africa to be together they want nigeria to be together they want cameroon to be together because they don't understand the granularities now ask yourself those boundaries they are defending was actually created by the slave masters none of them was created by an african there is no west african country at least that has an identity created by africans they were all created by the slave masters that's why when you talk about freedom there you see that all of them will say oh we favor one nigeria we favor one cameroon that's because they have a secret agreement between themselves to defend their interests against the negroes but of course the hermetic and negroid groups because of their obvious lack of common sense they don't know what is going on but let us find time to look at other things before we round up let us reference the war in america negro slavery and the bible a political religious essay by an old politician and it was published in 1862 and there we see the following now remember there were some authors that wouldn't write their names at that time because the same way the slave masters foot soldiers treat something like freedom fighting things like ambazonia things like biafra today it's the same way the quakers the abolitionists were treated at that time you need to bear this in mind and you can research it yourself god had so constituted this race which in the times of the scriptures were called ethiopians and which we call negroes from their color that they might become the inhabitants of the equatorial or warm regions of the earth these black people however were placed in africa alone which is almost entirely a thorough region 
and as America had also a large warm region with no Negroes in it, it was necessary that the purpose of God might be fulfilled, that Ethiopians should be sent to it, and therefore we are directly told here that God sent them there. So you see how the slave master deployed his God to enslave the Negroes. So further here you see what the Negroes themselves said. We were sent here, they will argue, by the omnipotent governor of the world and everything in it. And as we alone can live in such a country and cultivate it, so we shall assume it as our own, as being God's gift to us. And therefore we shall not only cultivate it, but we shall also rule and govern it. Not that we will deny to other men the liberty of living in it, whether they may be engaged in the pursuits of religion, of commerce, or of mere curiosity, but no man shall remain in it as a slaveholder or trafficker in slaves, whether black or white. Our country shall be free to other men as it is to ourselves, because it is God's country, but other men shall not rule in it. So you see how the Negroes themselves at that time felt too. They said they were sent there. Now, the question is, where did they see God? And God told them this. So you see why the slave master works to misinform the Negro. So he tells him things knowing that the Negro believes what he hears more than what his experience can show him. You can see the Hebrew Israelites today. They said 1619 to 2019. 2019 is almost gone. Nothing has changed. They are still sticking on it. So they are going to revise that their dates now. Maybe they will make it now 1620 to uh, 2020. They forget that if someone had died during this period, the Almighty had not fulfilled his own bargain to the person. So if somebody had died and you free the child, you haven't done anything. So they don't look at it that way, they just look at it from what the slave master is saying, which is unfortunate anyways. The Indian wannabes have come with theirs. But before we move forward, let us read one little thing from this same document. So here he says, in the south, they are fighting for what they call liberty and independence, while they hold in the most abject slavery, four million of their fellow men, who stand in the same position in the sight of God as they do themselves with this difference on the behalf of the slave that he is not insulting God by holding those who are created in his image in slavery. So you see what we're talking about. Let us reference Field Museum of Natural History funded by Marshall Field 1893 publication 346 Anthropological Series volume 21 number 3 Culture Areas of Nigeria by Wilfred D. Hambly and it was published 1935 and there we see the following. First we see the map of the expedition. It shows you French Cameroon and British Cameroon. So it is this British Cameroon today that is the Ambazonia you hear and you see further down where it sees Ibo, Ibibio and all that. Then Ijo. Remember at that time they hadn't created a fic and all those smaller places. And remember in these places alone, almost languages differ between every hundred kilometers, if not less. So you have to bear this in mind when they keep telling you how everybody were Indians and Indians and all that, all those crap is a lie. So now our interest is to show you some of the things about the area. The Fulanese, who are the slave master's food soldiers, and the Yoruba, which are, you can see now appears on the map, with Dahomey on the left. You remember, Dahomey is no longer anywhere today. The slave master controls all those things. That's why they wanted the Negro who was in power a few years ago out by all means. Because they have to draw this map, choose what they want on it, and they need a fool to be on, in power there. Or at least any of their foot soldiers in order to be able to do it because you can't tell a sensible person that you want to kill his siblings and he will just agree so it's that's why they need the Fulanese to rule and they need of course their Yoruba foot soldiers as well so you see what it tells us further down in this same book in his descent of man Charles Darwin favored Africa as the place of origin of the Negro but a commonly accepted hypothesis has regarded southern Asia as the original home of mankind where racial types began to differentiate and to spread 
not only toward Africa but in several other directions. Yet the ultimate origin of Negroes remains unknown and the phylogenetic relations of Negroes to pygmies, bushmen and hottentots is not understood. Our interest is for you to see how they separate the Negroes from the rest of Africa that they tell you they are all together today. The reason they keep telling you, oh Africa is one, that they are all together is to be able to use the unintelligent hermetic Negroid and Baba groups to enslave the Negro. That's all they do. Nothing more. The place is the way they want it. So when you are thinking, oh, Africa is poor, Africa is not doing well, West Africa, there is war, the Fulanese, that's how they want it. They come up with all kinds of excuses, uh, all kinds of lies all the time against the Negroes in that area. The duty of the Fulanese, the Babas, the Tuaregs, the Yorubas is to keep the Negroes in check for them on their behalf. That's just what they are doing. You might doubt us, but when you conduct your research, you will come back here to say, oh, now I see what you guys had seen. So it goes further to say, but as a working hypothesis, which is consonant with the known facts of somatology, language and cultural patterns, ethnologists regard the region of Northeast Africa near Lake Victoria, Nyanza, as a focus from which Negro tribes were forced westward. The probable line of migration was along the northern edge of the Congo Basin, scathing the dense tropical forest and making use of the broad east to west. This route has long been accessible to migrants and armies who took advantage of the wet seasons and knew the locations of wells. So you see that they each time they had placed the negroes separately so now bringing them together is they are able to use the unintelligent groups unfortunately against the negroes this is why you can see it very clearly look at nigeria look at biafra look at ambazonia when these unintelligent groups murder anyone in biafra or ambazonia do you hear any response from the slave master the answer is no and unfortunately because they don't have honor they don't have shame they will still open their mouths to tell you that they are your brothers that's imagine somebody killing your parents brazenly brutal terror after killing them they will tell you oh no we are brothers come and be brothers to us you see that they don't have that common sense whichever way you look at it from you will see that they obviously lack common sense and that's what the slave master saw that he's using Yes, for the Negro, he has seen that you t tell him what you want him to do. He will believe you ahead of any other thing. But for those ones, their own problem is they don't have common sense. That's just it. So further on the right of the same page, which you can pause it and read yourself, it says, Gradually, the most typical Negro tribes with distinctive physique and languages were forced into the least favorable situations of the coastal regions of Nigeria and further West Africa. The crew of Liberia, also the Igbo and the Ejo of Nigeria are typical Negroes, thick set, prognathos and having thick everted lips and a high nasal index, pet plates, whatever. But our interest is for you to see what it's all about. It goes further down. It says Bantu speaking Negroes are usually thought to have had their origin in the region of Lake Victoria, whence they spread westwards into the central Congo region and Cameroon. Such migrations have caused a mixture of Bantu and Negro thongs, which in southern in eastern Nigeria and the adjacent Cameroon are known as the semi-Bantu languages. The evidence for Bantu migrations, some of which have occurred within recent centuries, rests on native traditions, mythology, somatological threats, and structure of language and comparison of cultural threats. So again, we ask you, do you see why Ambazonia and uh, Biafra are not being treated as anything serious? They know that their foot soldiers will do the damage for them. That's why they are working very hard to get weapons to them and perhaps when you see them cut off social network, then you know that the massacre is coming. That's what we see. They do it all the time because the slave master knows that the foot soldiers, they lack humanity. They lack common sense. If you doubt what we're saying, if you have any Fulani around you, 
just psych him and try to find out why do you people kill yourselves there and see what he will tell you you will understand what we're saying the moment you have a discussion with them or the Yorubas. You will see the Yorubas, they will say, eh, but we, they don't like this, but because some of them are actually not Yorubas, but Negroes who have been conquered, they became Yoruba by conquest. So there's an element of the humanity in the Negro in them and the, their acculturation that they, they had become Yorubas in them both are now struggling for supremacy that's why you see that while the fulani jihadists are doing their thing the yoruba press is doing the propaganda for them that's why they were able to change overnight from boko haram to fulani headsmen to herdsmen and to bandits who gives them those terms the fulanis are known for mediocrity they are not properly educated they can't make progress however you look at it you see the aruga Look at what it is, a shanty town. The highest level of promiscuity is what you see in there. What kind of development can that bring? But they now claim that it's going to create jobs. So that's who they are. So somebody obviously gave them the word bandit to use. If you were to look at the confirmation of the Chief Justice of Nigeria at the Senate House, you will see that mediocrity is what they propagate. And then that's why the slave master likes to put them ahead knowing that they will never allow you they, they love their mediocrity they enjoy it that's who they are imagine a people that captured negroes to go and farm for the slave masters and bring back products that they buy that should tell you who they are so imagine a somebody who is closing a car manufacturing outfit owned by an individual but a negro but wants to give them ruga that ruga will create jobs can you tell us what type of job ruga that is rearing cattle that people will not even consume that is filthy cattle cattle that is not properly kept that's what they claim will bring jobs that should tell you right there where the slave master is always using them against the negroes the place can never make progress unless the fulanese are somehow clipped in their own space so here you see where it says the expeditionary route passed among tribes speaking the main African languages. Sudanic languages of an isolating character are spoken by the Yoruba, Nupe, Kanuri, Angas, Keri Keri, and Buduma. Semitic in the form of the Arabic is the thong of the Shua Arabs near Lake Chad. This is Nigeria. Hausa is to some extent Hamitic, but thones of semantic value that the present in Sudanic and Bantu Negro languages are found also in Hausa. The Fulani languages classified by C. Menhoff as proto hamitic So you see that there is even no relationship between the Negroes and these people. You see how you can get all that you need by just reading these materials yourself. So here you see where it says from east to west along the coast of Nigeria, the occurrence of several linguistic groups may be noted. To the southwest of Cross River live tribes of Bantu speech, while west of these extends an area of semi-Bantu speech. P. A. Talbot regards the Ijo tribe, which is situated on each side of the Niger Delta, as typical Negroes who have preserved a pure Negro speech that has existed from ancient times. He states that Ejo is the earliest of all the Nigerian languages. This evidence agrees with the postulated forcing of early Negro inhabitants toward the coast. The Niger divides the Igbo to the east of the river from the Edo on the western bank and still further west are the Yoruba. The languages of these tribes are not yet studied in detail but the knowledge that is available supports the theory that the earliest Negro inhabitants are now represented by the maritime tribes. Now remember, those maritime tribes actually got there where they were trying to run away from Fulani and Arab slave raids and of course Yorubas as well. So you can doubt us, all we challenge you to do is conduct your research. Again we ask you, how could Adam and Eve have had children that now go and live on water? So that's how those people got there. If you read the materials, you see where it is actually documented. So let's see if we can round up with what it says on the right. It says Ghana and in bracket Kumbi. 
that's the former name perhaps or other name appears to have been the most ancient political center of the western sudan founded about the third century of the christian era note that very well third century of the christian era the state owed its power to non-negro tribes non-negro tribes note that when we were telling the so-called african americans that they were not from ghana some people wanted to fight us now you see it somehow giving you clues it says non-negro tribes who flourished until the middle of the 13th century when ghana was raised by mandingo conquerors the state of songhai in the bend of the niger had an a principal towns kukia and later gas or whatever during several centuries the states of ghana and songhai flourished simultaneously with the latter in a secondary position of strength and political influence the rulers of songhai are thought to have been of hamiaritic libyan or nilotic extraction much of the history of songhai is intimately connected with the powerful kingdom of melee built up by the mandingo but our interest is where you see the non-negroes and all that so that you understand what we're saying that all black people are not the same the yorubas are not the same as debos now if you have listened recently you would have started hearing things like how Igbos are related to yorubas it's part of the conquest the fulani and the yoruba work together for the conquest with the ashanti in ghana and other groups we are yet to identify properly but the truth is that they are not negroes like these other people now ask yourself why is it that the whole of west african subregion is almost being ruled by fulanese and they are known for not bringing anything called progress wherever they are it's all about war the slave master uses them to put the negroes in check put them in servitude in yoke them so our challenge to you is to look for these materials, study them yourself and see what you will find. We will be happy to hear from you at least that this is where you think you people got it wrong. Look at the books. You can't be more Catholic than the Pope. Look at the books. At least you will see who they bought, who they classified as what. And that way you will understand what games they are playing. That's all you need to do. So in conclusion, we see that warfare and tribal movements in the north brought pressure to bear on tribes which were gradually forced into the dense forest regions of the south. This process resulted in the intrusion of Mohammedanism and other factors of a North African culture into some Negro cultures of southern Nigeria. So you see what we are telling you about the Jaws, how they found themselves to be on water. They were running away from Arab Fulani slave raids but if you notice people tell you about the european slave trade they don't even mention the arab one and both happened simultaneously but it was the arabs that did the capturing along with the europeans if you were to study the materials very well and you have a little understanding of chronology we will just round up here so in conclusion we see that despite the doubtful origin of the fulani their function as makers of Nigerian history is clear in outline. The Fulani penetrated Nigeria peacefully and gradually from the 13th century onward. You see when it happened. But this settlement as pastoral people was followed by a demand for political power. You see the game of the Aruga today. So that those who can read, defending it, there are people who are blind, who are myopic, who can't see tomorrow. You see they come in first peacefully. Then after that, you will see the terror in them. So to a great extent, the Fulani are nomads, yet they settled and concentrated their forces sufficiently to establish their foci by conquest. In 1808, the Fulani subdued the Hausa states, after which they unsuccessfully assailed Borno. They couldn't conquer Bornu's. It was the British that conquered them for them. Remember, they will come initially peacefully. You will think you are dealing with humans. Then, when they gather, get a little number, you you see who they are made up of. That's why the place can never make progress, no matter what you do. It's just mere waste of time. The slave master understands what we're telling you today. We want you to look for these materials and study them yourself. And of course, here we come to the end of this edition of Entering Behavior for Negroes, Part 1. It is that same entering behavior that you see the Fulani is using today. You see them bring their cattle. Then you get used to them being around you. You think that's how it's going to be. 
before your children grow up and know that they are visitors they will rise up one day slaughter everybody they don't have anything called human kindness in their veins never so we are asking you to open your eyes and see what is going on look at the whole of sub-saharan africa or west africa as they call it and central africa you will understand what we're saying we thank you very much for listening and we do encourage you to at least find time to conduct your own research peace